first speaker today is Sam Das. He will tell us about bark entanglement and gallography. 45 minutes, please. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'd like to thank the organizers for going ahead with this meeting. I was hoping to be in Moscow where I've never been and I hope that uh, I will be able to get there uh, soon. And, and I hope that this thing gets uh, over and behind us. I'm going to talk about some work uh, uh, which has recently appeared. This is done in collaboration with my colleagues at the Tata Institute in Mumbai, <clears throat> Anura Kaushal, Gautam Mandal, and Sandeep Trivedi. So we have been thinking about this for quite a while now, but uh, things uh, sort of started getting um, condensed like just a few months back. Somehow this is not, my computer is not responding. Oh, okay, now it's okay. So as we all know, the root Akayana description and its extensions provide a strikingly simple geometric expression for the entanglement entropy of a subregion in a field theory. So this is the subregion we are talking about. In this talk, we will explore a different question. And the question is, what is the meaning of entropy of a co-dimension wall spatial subregion of the bulk? And the picture is like this. The, the bulk region can be anywhere. And we will in fact talk about very special subregions. It's quite clear that this cannot be simply related to a geometric entropy of the dual theory. For example, the dual theory may not have any space at all. So the kind of bulk regions we are talking about are regions like this, or even regions which are separated by, uh, by a partition. We will argue that this has a meaning in terms of von Neumann entropy, which is associated with the subalgebra of the dual quantum field theory. And this subalgebra comes from a subregion of the target space. And I explain what I mean. Since the bulk is a theory of gravity, it is a priori not clear what is the meaning of entanglement between two regions except in the regime where this can be thought of as entanglement of perturbative modes, which include matter and gravitons. Our motivation is in fact to provide a more precise meaning to this notion, which beyond, goes beyond the above regime. For gravitational theories with holographic dual, we will argue that entanglement in target space provides this notion. In an appropriate limit, this would reduce to the notion of entanglement of perturbative modes. Now in usual field theory, the leading contribution to the entanglement entropy of a region is given by the area law. It's the, it's the area of the bounding surface multiplied by an appropriate power of the UV cutoff. One would think that in a UV complete theory of gravity like string theory, one would expect that the result should be finite. And we may ask what provides this cutoff? If it is something like a string theory, is this the string length or the Newton constant? We will conjecture in fact that the cutoff is in fact the, is the Newton constant. In fact, we will conjecture that to leading order this entropy in fact saturates the Bekenstein bound and provides some sanity checks for this in theories of DP brains. I should mention that a similar conjecture was made by Bianchi and Meyer some times ago, but for entirely different reasons. I would like to clarify that sometimes the phrase bulk entanglement entropy refers to entanglements of perturbative bulk modes across an extremal or a quantum extremal surface. For the HRT service, this is the one upon n correction to the entropy of a subregion of the dual field theory. And this has been studied quite extensively. In fact, uh, it is beginning to play a very important role in discussions of uh, black hole evaporation. We are interested, however, in a more general question. The entropy we discuss is associated with any region of the bulk, 
not necessarily ones which are bounded by extremal or quantum extremal surfaces. Mergent space is the duality of two dimensional non critical strings and gauge quantum mechanics of a single n by n Hermitian matrix. This is a theory which can be solved exactly in the singlet sector, that means the gauge theory. And by fixing a gauge and then using further freedom to rotate these matrices, we can make this matrix diagonal. The diagonal entries then become coordinates of fermions. And in the double scaling limit, we have one as a Hamiltonian of these fermions, which are moving in an inverted harmonic oscillator potential. In a second quantization, there is a fermion field, the non-relativistic fermion field with the Hamiltonian, which I've written here. And the space of eigenvalues becomes an emergent space coordinate in this theory. This is the bulk space. One can also go and write a bosonic formulation of the theory in terms of a density of eigenvalues. This is called the collective field theory. And the fluctuations around this large end saddle has a space dependent coupling, which is explicitly illustrated in the cubic part of the class, uh, cubic part of this action. So this coupling, which comes from, which is, which would be this GS would be related to the coupling of the dual string theory, will play an important role in what follows. This then is the bulk description. And the field eta is related to the only dynamical field in two dimensional string theory, namely the massless tachyon. Given a formulation in terms of a normal one plus one dimensional field theory, which however is very complicated, but simple written in terms of fermions, we can ask, like in any other field theory, what is the entanglement entropy of a region of the bulk with the complement? For example, I've taken an interval between two points uh, labeled by Q1 and Q2. Q1 and Q2 are coordinates which are related to the original space of eigenvalues. If we treat the collective field theory perturbatively, the lowest order result is logarithmically divergent. This is entirely expected because it's just a massless scalar in one plus one dimension. However, the fermionic field theory predicts a finite answer. The calculation of entanglement entropy was in this, in the fermionic field theory was done in the 1990s and revisited a few years back. And I've given the result for this. It's still a log, but the cutoff is provided by the coupling of the theory, which however is space dependent. Since the cutoff is provided by the coupling of the theory, from the point of view of string theory, one may think of it as a non perturbative effect, which would not be visible in the wall sheet formulation. It seems to indicate that in a general situation, the cutoff should be the Newton constant. So this is a, this is a straightforward discussion of an entanglement entropy of a field theory and we were lucky in this case, but we want to learn what is the meaning of this quantity in the original quantum mechanics, which we started out with. So let us begin with the simplest case of quantum mechanics of one particle in one space dimension. You might think in this trivial situation, what can be entangled with what, but as we will soon argue, there is a well-defined notion of entanglement in this theory. The system is assumed to be in a pure state with a wave function given by psi of x. What we want to do is to restrict ourselves to some interval a, which is given by this interval line between a and b, and concern ourselves to measurements which can be made in this interval. This is the analog of this interval, which I talked about in the inverted harmonic oscillator potential. This defines a subalgebra of operators, which can be written in this following form. 
And what we want to define is a density matrix in the Hilbert space band only by these basis vectors which lie in this interval, which evaluates expectation values of such operators. For a single particle, this is quite trivial, but let me go through it anyway. The Hilbert space is in fact now a direct sum. The, the first element of the sum corresponds to a basis vectors which lie between A and B. The second element of the sum consists of basis vectors which lie in the complement. And it is easy to see that the density matrix which is associated with say, for example, the one comma zero sector is given by this following expression. This leads to an entanglement entropy, the von Neumann entropy of this density matrix. And you can easily evaluate that. And the answer is as follows. Here, the quantity PA is the probability that the particle is in the region of interest. So what this quantity is measuring is the probability of the particle being in the region of interest and the entanglement what one is talking about is associated with the reduced density matrix which reproduces all measurements which are made in this region. In a similar way one can discuss the complement of, uh, of this and clearly the total entropy will be a sum of these two quantities. This clearly generalizes to n fermions in this setup. Now we have n plus one sectors. In an obvious notation, we write it in, in this following form, where this silver space corresponds, it denotes a sector where p of the coordinates are in the subregion and the rest in the complement. Just as an example, you take two particles, you have these three possible. Uh, three possible Hilbert spaces, which sum up to the entire Hilbert space. And in each of these, we have anti-symmetrized basis vectors between in, in of this particular form, because these are fermions. I should mention that this kind of decomposition of full Hilbert space into a sum over sectors has appeared earlier in many contexts, in particular, it has appeared in discussions of entanglements of entanglement entropy in gauge theories from which we drew a lot of intuition. Given a density matrix in the full Hilbert space, the reduced density matrix pretty much like the two particle, like the two single particle example can be written in this following form and an entanglement entropy now becomes a sum. For example, for two particles in a Slater determinant state, you can evaluate this explicitly and the, the evaluation needs an answer which depends on quantities which tell you the, the integrals of the single particle modes only over the region of interest and their overlaps. This is an example of what is called a target space entropy. We proved that this is in fact exactly the same quantity which, which is computed in the second quantized framework with the condition that the total number of particles is n. And that of course should have followed, but it is kind of a sanity check. I should mention that notion similar to target space entropy has appeared implicitly in discussions of entropy in string theory using a wall sheet formalism. It's also related to discussions of holographic entanglement entropies, which involve the internal sphere as well as the boundary. This is also related to notions of entwinement, which is discussed in, the, in this paper we have quoted. It is obvious that, that this quantity is finite. It is finite because n is finite, because the number of particles is finite a fact which becomes less apparent in the second quantized formalism. This then is the origin of finiteness of entanglement entropy in two dimensional string theory. This is why the cutoff in, in, the, in that theory was the bulk coupling and the bulk coupling is of course one upon n. From this point of view, the finiteness is traceable to what is called a stringy exclusion principle. 
What this means is that in terms of the original matrix, the traces of higher powers of matrices are related to traces of lower powers for finite n. And in fact, this can be seen very easily if you write the fermion wave functions in terms of certain polynomials made out of multiple traces of the matrix. Or in a slightly different formalism, performing a bosonization carefully for finite n. And if you look at the formula which appear in this bosonization, you immediately realize that the emergent space actually comes with a lattice spacing, which is of the order of one upon n. We will now apply these lessons to more interesting holographic theories with multiple matrices. So maybe I should pause for some questions. Uh, Sumit, is it important yeah. whether the particles interact or not in your Hamiltonian? No, it's not important, but it's easy to, I mean, the conceptually it's not important, but computationally, we have only dealt with particles which are free. You can, I mean, the concepts just go forward as usual. Okay. So let's proceed to the simplest example, holographic example, which involves many different matrices. Let me first discuss the bulk. The bulk we will discuss is a bulk of 2A string theory with n coincident D0 brains. This is the standard supergravity solution with the string frame metric, the dilaton, I haven't written the, the gauge field, and the various parameters are related to n, the number of coincident D0 brains, the string coupling GS, and the string length LS. What we want to do is that we want to divide the nine dimensional space into two parts. And this will be divided in two parts by taking in one of the transverse directions, which I call X1, and placing a screen which divides the two parts at X1 equal to D. And our aim is to give a meaning to the entanglement between the two subregions in terms of a holographic description. The holographic description is of course D0 brain quantum mechanics. In fact, we will consider a heated version where there is a blackening factor, which is given by this function f of r. The, the scale which appears in this factor is related to the temperature of the black D0 brains by this relationship. And the picture is roughly as follows. This is, this is the region where the, where the supergravity D0 brains are living. This is the location of the horizon. And for reasons which we will explain soon, we will place a screen at x1 equal to d far from the horizon. And our region of interest is this. We want to think of this actually as a thermophile double state. <clears throat> which is a purification of the thermal state. So what is the holographic theory? The holo dual theory is of course supersymmetric quantum mechanics of N matrices. This, the matrices are denoted by Xi. These are N by N. Each of them is an N by N Hermitian matrix and their fermionic partners. As in the case of a single matrix, one can fix a gauge, which is the temporal gauge, AT equal to zero. And all one is left with is a Gauss law constraints, which requires the wave functions to be singlet. One can then suitably rescale the variables in variables which appear in the theory to write a Hamiltonian, which is of the following form. And the interesting thing about writing the Hamiltonian on, in this form is that it becomes quite clear that there are no dimensionless parameters in the theory. There is only an energy scale, which by all the rescalings I have brought out, and this energy scale we will call lambda. Everything else is dimensionless inside. As is well known, this theory has a Coulomb branch where all the expectation values of all the matrices 
can be chosen to be diagonal. They commute with each other. And this gauge can be chosen to be diagonal. These diagonal elements are the coordinates of the n d0 brains of supergravity. So the base space of the gravitational theory becomes the target space of this quantum mechanics. And all of this is quite standard. The gravity solution we wrote is the dual to the origin of the Coulomb branch, where the expectation values of Xs are all zero. There are also solutions at generic points in the Coulomb branch, which I will not explicitly discuss. But the fact that the expectation values of x equal to zero mean, doesn't mean that the wave functions are delta function localized there. The wave functions, in fact, has a spread. As is very well known, the spread of the wave function is this scale, which is again the same power of gs times n raised to the power one third. In the quantum mechanics theory, this is in fact the size of the bound state. In fact, if you look at the gravity solution and ask when does the string frame curvature becomes large, it is precisely at the scale. So the picture in super, while the picture in supergravity in the supergravity space would be a set of D0 brains, the fluctuations of the locations of the D0 brains extend up to this point r equal to r0. This theory also has a dilaton and the dilaton actually now becomes large for small values of r. So to be <coughs> in a region which is controllable, we are going to place the screen far away from the strong coupling region of the theory and from the place where the string frame curvature becomes large. There is, of course, a large region like this because Gs time n itself is extremely large. Again, in the temporal gauge, the remaining time independent symmetry can be fixed by diagonalizing one of the matrices x1. Since the other matrices do not commute with x1, they cannot be diagonalized anymore. Let's denote the eigenvalues of this matrix X1 by lambda i. After fixing the gauge and after using a time independent remaining symmetry, there are still a remaining symmetry. And these are wild transformations. What wild transformations do is they permute the eigenvalues lambda i and the mix up the matrix elements of the other matrices, which are x2 till xn. To respect this symmetry, we should write a generic state in the following form. We take a particular order of the lambda i's and, and a particular realization of the matrices and add to it the wild transform, which would include permutations of the lambda i as well as this mixing up of the other matrix elements. When these other matrices were not there, like in the one dimensional example of the famous van der Mond determinant factor, which comes from diagonalizing the single matrix, was responsible for making these things fermions. But now it's a little more complicated because the variables which appear in the wave functions are not just the lambda i's and the remaining symmetry mixes up the matrix elements in a non-trivial fashion. A general operator in the full Hilbert space can likewise be written in this following form. Of interest is the entropy associated with the restriction, with this restriction of the target space. Using the standard relationship between the matrices and the coordinates in the supergravity solution, we therefore, there was a missing word, say that the target space subregion to be defined by the restriction of eigenvalues of x1. The restriction would, of course, now everything is dimensionless, so the restriction has to be placed in terms of dimensionless quantities, and the dimensionless quantity d0 is related to the D which appeared in the 
supergravity solution by this factor, which was used to rescale the matrices to dimensionless anyway. So this is pretty much like a single matrix problem. We started with the bulk. We placed a screen in the bulk like this, and then we identified what should be the division in the target space. But now there are nine other matrices to deal with, and we have to decide what to do with these other matrices. To make a decision of that, it is useful to consider a typical snapshot of a configuration of the eigenvalues and the matrix elements. So here I've given an example where n is equal to three. So all of them are three by three matrices. And I have displayed only two of the matrices, x1, which has been chosen to be diagonal, and x2, where I've displaced all the matrix elements. The picture denotes a typical configuration of the theory. I've drawn it in a picture, drawn the picture in a suggestive way where these red dots can be thought of as D brains, and this is the region of interest. So this configuration corresponds to two of these D0 brains lying in the region of interest and one of them outside the region of interest. I should warn you that this is not a picture of expectation values of these matrices. So this is not a picture of the Coulomb branch in the supergravity solution. We are working at the, set, at the origin of the Coulomb branch. What this represents is a configuration which is one of the configurations which appear in the wave function of the theory. And the wave function evaluates the probability amplitude of having a configuration like this. I have joined these, these uh, I'll still call them D0 brains, even though they are really de depicting configurations by little lines. And as we normally do, we think of them as open strings joining D0 brains. There are sets of open strings which join the same D0 brain with each other. <clears throat> these are these matrix elements, the diagonal matrix animals, while the off-diagonal matrix elements are denoted by the open strings which join different D0 brains. Now, we have placed these things, these, these D0 brains, this is, a, this is the direction of X1. So this, I'll take the direction of X1, so it's represented by this, uh, eigenvalues which are lambda i. So we have to decide in our, and this is our division, we have to decide in calculating the density matrix, which of these other variables are we going to keep and which of them are we going to integrate over. One possibility is to only keep the two by two block and integrate out the rest. So what this means, we keep these open strings of these configurations such that they lie entirely within this thing. Given that the density matrix I've written down below, rho is the original density matrix of the full, uh, of the full in the full Hilbert space. And I have written out, I have sort of put a little box on the coordinates or, or the matrix elements which are being integrated over. A second possibility is to retain the off-diagonal block matrix elements as well. Namely, I only integrate out lambda 3 and x 3 3. <clears throat> At this point, we don't have a way to decide between these two possibilities, but these look like natural possibilities for us. What could the answer look like? Consider this, consider this case where the state of the whole system 
is a thermal state or more precisely a thermophil double state. This would be characterized by a dimensionless temperature T naught. Recall the matrix, the matrix theory does not have any dimensionless number. So all the scales, all dimensional quantities have to be related to the single dimensionful scale in the theory. The, the answer of the target space entanglement entropy we discussed is should therefore be a function of T naught and a function of D naught. D naught was the division in the target space, which I explained earlier. <clears throat> Since a density matrix in a generic sector encode an entanglement of n squared degrees of freedom, we expect that the answer should be proportional to n square. In fact, this can be seen by rewriting the expression in terms of normalized density matrices in the following form. So the original reduced density matrix was rho tilde. Now I've defined a new one, rho hat, where this is a like a is a trace uh, of the, of this rho rho tilde. And you can think about this expression and show that this object itself should be order n square, and they are multiplied by things which are like probabilities, which lie between zero and one, and therefore the total answer should be order n square. This is the generic expectation. We will therefore expect that the, this target space entanglement entropy should be proportional to n square and some function of t naught and d naught. The theory, of course, has fermionic matrices. None of those can be chosen to be diagonal in the gauge which we are working in. And therefore, they have to be treated in a manner which is identical to the bosonic matrices, to the nine bosonic matrices, which also have of diagonal elements. Unfortunately, while the existence of a bound state of ND0 brains has been proved quite some time ago, explicit expressions for the wave function are still not known. Nevertheless, there has been considerable progress in calculating quantities in the D0 brain quantum mechanics and related models numerically. This gives us a hope that a numerical calculation of this target space entanglement entropy should be possible in the near future. And we are currently busy setting up the problem by utilizing a replica trick in which which will make such a calculation possible. So, as is obvious, we, we are not able to do this calculation, so we make a conjecture. Our conjecture is that the target space entanglement entropy we discussed is given by the expression, which is exactly the Bekenstein bound, namely the area of the, of the surface, entangling surface, in Einstein frame divided by four times the Newton constant. Now for the black D0 brain, let us look at the expression for this quantity. The area for a given temperature T is given by this expression where this coordinate rho is the radial coordinate along the X1 equal to D plane. And you can stare at this expression and immediately realize that this is I R divergent. The integral over rho does not converge. This is why we introduced a cutoff rho naught. Since the curvature becomes large at the scale, which is gs n to the power one third, it may be natural to take rho naught to be of the order of this scale and evaluate these expressions. But this is rather ambiguous. To get a more precise answer is to note that the difference of this area with the area of zero temperature is in fact finite. So this quantity is the quantity which one should aim at comparing with results from the matrix model. And this quantity is insensitive to the cutoff in the regime when the Tuft coupling is large. Having noted that, 
we can now take the upper limit to infinity because in this difference rho naught doesn't appear and expand the result in powers of the ratio of the horizon radius to this number d to the location d and this is the result which you get this is the result from calculating the area divided by the, the newton constant and now we want to compare it with what one would expect from a d0 brain quantum mechanics but to do that we need to express this quantity in terms of the dimensionless temperature and the location of the entangled surface. First, we express the various dimensional parameters of the supergravity solution in terms of the string coupling, the string length, and n, Rh in terms of the temperature, and Newton constant in terms of the string coupling and the string length. And then we note that since a D0 brain quantum mechanics has just one scale, the appropriate dimensionless temperature has to be defined by this equation. Next, we note that as is standard in the ADS CFT correspondence, the transverse direction to the brains is also proportional to the energy scale of the theory, which tells you the dimensionless distance. The uh, dimensionless location has to be related to D by this expression. You plug everything back in, and what you find is an expression for the difference of this entropy, which is proportional to n square, and which has some powers in T0 and D0. The form of this answer is exactly what we accept, expected from D0 brain quantum mechanics. And the important thing is that it is proportional to n square. It was important that the cutoff appearing in the bulk entanglement entropy is the Newton constant and not the string length. If we used, for example, the area divided by the string length, the answer would have additional factor of gs squared and this cannot be a result of any d0 brain, d0 brain quantum mechanics calculation because that theory does not have any dimensionless parameter i should also mention that the result we displaced is valid in the regime when supergravity is reliable this requires that the dimensionless temperature is small n is large and Furthermore, the entangling surface is far from the horizon. In fact, for smaller values of D0, the relationship between the transverse coordinates of the background and the matrices become rather complicated. And for higher values of T0, stringy and loop corrections become important. And one expects corrections to the area law conjecture. I should also mention that we could have computed the area in string frame and used the formula with the Newton constant replaced by the string length. What one finds is that once again powers of GS square disappear, but now the result is order one rather than order n square, and that is quite unnatural from the point of view of the matrix quantum mechanics. These considerations can be generalized for DP brains with P less than three. In this case, we take a surface which is located at some transverse direction from the DP brain and fills the entire DP brain. Now the DP brain, of course, has its own extent. In this case, I've drawn a picture of a D string <clears throat> with a size L. So, our conjecture will lead a result which depends on L. Once again, we use the ADS CFT correspondence to learn how to relate L to a dimensionless L naught because we know that L is the length scale along the brain. So it should be expressed in terms of the inverse of the energy scale of the theory, which is given by this. And once again, 
what you would find is that in the final expression for the difference of entropies, the string coupling has disappeared. So the result is conceivable in a dual P plus one dimensional field theory. The entanglement entropy in this field theory is again a target space entanglement. The procedure is pretty similar, except that all the matrix elements are functions of the DP brain coordinates. We again expect an answer proportional to n squared. We could also consider an entanglement entropy which comes from a restriction both in target space and in base space, which have been considered by other people in a different context. Let me finish by making some comments. Our considerations have been limited to very simple entanglements or entangling surfaces for which the connection of the matrices to the dual theory is very simple. However, we can also consider more interesting surfaces in the bulk, for example, spherical surfaces, which are bounded by a sphere. <clears throat> and the corresponding operator for the dual theory is also known, it is this quantity, and that, that is also a Hermitian operator. And again, we could choose the time independent symmetries to die. them up, but it, technically it's a lot more involved. Let me finish with an epilogue. We have proposed that the entanglement of bulk regions map to target space entanglement, or more generally, a combination of target and base space entanglement. For simple entangling surfaces, this map can be stated precisely. And we find there are two natural candidates for the reduced density matrix. This quantity should be calculable numerically, and we are setting up a replica trick method to make such a numerical calculation possible. We furthermore conjecture that the leading answer saturates the area law. This means that in an ultraviolet complete theory of gravity, the cutoff in entanglement entropy is provided by the Newton constant and not, for example, by the string length. The target space entanglement entropy is, of course, defined for all values of the parameters, T0, D0, and N. And it should be possible to see how this quantity changes beyond the regime which we explored. In particular, for a finite N and higher T0, bulk locality will fail, stringy and loop corrections become important, but the target space entanglement entropy continues to make sense. And our hope is that this can be calculated explicitly in the near future and our conjecture can either be proved or disproved. So with this, I thank you for your patience. Thank you. Thank you very much for your uh, very interesting talk, your, uh, your conjecture. So maybe some people will join you. Any questions, please? Uh, I have a question. Please. Um, so probably you can uh, clarify. So again, we have to take uh, which subregion and where and uh, I mean, just to suggest, can you summarize once again, what is a conjecture and what is a dual? Okay. So let me go back to the picture. Yeah. Let's do the D0 brains. So this is the picture of supergravity. There are a set of D0 brains which are sitting here. This is, uh, this is a set of black. D0 brain, so there is a yeah, yeah, horizon yeah. here. And we have taken, uh, divided the space into parts where this is what we call the region of interest. And this is the location x1 equal to d, where x1 is one of the transverse coordinates. Oh, so we can just, for example, if we consider not D0 brain background, but for example, ADS5 or ADS4 background, we have to divide, for example, Poincare, in Poincare patch, we have to divide it, for example, into halves. Right, uh, and you consider the entanglement no, no. between. No, this entangling, this entangled surface, actually cuts the S five as well. 
Oh, you have to consider in S5 as well. It, okay. it, uh, it's what, you know, with this, this, this Cartesian coordinate thing. This is the case which we have discussed so far. Okay, okay, okay. So um, if, if you consider, for example, point at S5 cross S5, just for example, we have how the splitting should be, for example, as, as an example. Oh, so as an example, so for the ADS5 cross S5, you would write yeah, yeah. a, you know, write a metric, you know, just, I'll just do. So there are three of these. Yeah. Right. And then, uh, then you have, sorry, this is A h to the minus half and then you have h to the half so this is standard the d3 brain metric before taking yep. a near horizon limit so you write this as x6 square and this is the x1 we are talking about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this is the six okay. dimensional transverse phase to the D3 brains. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If you want to think in terms of ADS5 cross S5, and this is my comment uh, towards the end, you should take a surface which is R equal to constant. I mean, these are functions of R. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay. That's not what you haven't and considered that so far. And your conjecture is that this is dual to uh, yeah. target space entanglement, dual? right? Yeah. So the dual uh, okay, is, okay. so if n equal to three, right? So you take x1 as a, a diagonal matrix and you restrict the values of these things. So for example, this is a picture where two of the eigenvalues are bigger than d, and one of the eigenvalues is smaller than D. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Can you imagine this? this uh, you can organize a renormalization group in a large, I mean, you can organize a renormalization group in the N, so integrating some part of N, and uh, given the running of effective Kalplin, can you make something like this, or this is very complicated? Like an old work of Brizan? Uh, I, I think, you know, uh, we had thought a lot about that. I mean, this, this kind of renormalization group appears in discussions of matrix models and, uh, you know, uh, 2D gravity uh, things. And we thought a lot about that. I think there is a connection, but uh, we don't have a very precise connection yet. Okay. This is also an integrating out, of course. But uh, I don't know how it's connected to a renormalization group. It should be sort of connected, but I don't know the precise relationship. Okay, thank you. Uh, Sumit, I have a question. Yeah. Does your conjecture is supposed to be valid for infinite n or for finite n? No, this, this is the leading answer for large n. At finite n, you should get, you know, lots of corrections. Okay, thank you. Uh, Shumit, can you hear me? This yes. Yeah. yeah. So I just wanted to make this uh, comment that although we don't have a matrix model calculation uh, for the quantities that we um, want to calculate for target space entanglement entropy, but uh, the various ingredients that went into our conjecture about the, on the matrix side, uh, we, we do have evidence for some of them. Uh, in the context of bosonic BFSS um, matrix uh, models, uh, you know, the, the size of the D0 brains, um, you know, the, the fact that the size of the D0 brains are given uh, as order one in the kind of units that we talked about, you know, the GSN, uh, GS uh, to the power one third times N. So there, there is an evidence of that numerically for the bosonic BFSS matrix models, as well as uh, you know bosonic BFSS matrix models, in which the number of uh, matrices, which is nine, is uh, replaced by some arbitrary uh, large number d. 
so in the in the context of uh, this large number of matrices and bosonic bfss matrix models there is an analytic calculation which uh, gives the size of the d0 drains uh, that we have used that you have used in your uh, talk yeah, yeah, I mean, look at this paper by gautam and takeshi morita from some time ago about this this i think probably the only kind of analytical calculation in this game And of course, the numerical calculations of Hanada and Nishimura and collaborators uh, also explicitly see the scale. I mean, this is, I mean, their calculations are expansions in these dimensionless quantities. Yes. Okay. If not, let's thank the speaker again. Thank you very much.